Um, the editors of the Citing Slavery Project and I appreciate this opportunity to share our work with you and look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, so law was critical to the establishment and growth of American slavery from commerce to criminal law to inheritance. Slavery related disputes made up a significant portion of American dockets in the 19th century. Judges authored thousands of appellate opinions on the subject, yet the influence of these cases remains underappreciated. In part, the failure to recognize the full influence of slave cases results from the difficulty of finding them. Getting access to such cases has required sifting through thousands of printed case reports or using expensive legal databases normally available only to lawyers and law professors. As a result, the past and continued influence of slave cases remains mostly hidden. The Citing Slavery Project aims to make this legal history of slavery accessible and relevant to students, researchers, and the public. Once completed, our database at www.citingslavery.org will offer open access to thousands of slave cases and give users tools to analyze the influence of these cases on modern law. Today, we'll first provide a background on the law of slavery, then we'll discuss what our research tells us about the legacy of these cases. And finally, we'll provide more information about our project, sharing our progress and our vision for its future. From commerce to criminal law to inheritance, slave-related disputes made up a significant portion of American dockets. Appellate case reporters contain roughly 10,000 cases concerning enslaved people. Despite their prevalence, slave cases, especially those involving routine legal matters, have received little attention from legal scholars. Like judges, these scholars have tended to see slavery as essentially irrelevant to most legal debates. They find that the rules and decisions reached in slave cases remain valid even outside of the slave context from which they arose. Non-lawyers have failed to grapple with slave cases as well, but their neglect may stem from their lack of access to the expensive legal databases that would allow them to find or read slave cases and the cases that cite them. The goal of our project is to make it easier to access those cases and to encourage their study to further understanding of the important influence of law of slavery on the development of American law and commerce. A recognition of these cases is vital because they continue to exert a significant influence on American law, both directly and indirectly. We'll start today by discussing that influence. My research has revealed that cases involving human property are still commonly cited as good law in the 21st century. That the indirect influence of these cases on judicial decision-making is even bigger. Let me give you an example from 1999 case in the Tennessee Court of Appeals. In this case, the court faced a simple question of law. Could a jury award damages both for loss of use and decrease in market value for injury to personal property? The suit was brought after a fire destroyed a company's industrial shredding equipment, like the one pictured on the screen here. In coming to its decision, the court cited Johnson v. Perry, an 1841 Tennessee case involving an enslaved person, a man who himself was considered property. The court cited this case because of the first judicial opinion to explain what damages were available to personal property in Tennessee. This slide reproduces a direct quote from the court's decision. It analyzes this case about damage to human property like any other case, no differently from the next citation, a case about damage to a car. So let's give you a moment to look at this uh, slide. The, the court, uh, and read it as well, the court held that if the injury had been temporary, the plaintiff could recover damages for the loss of the slave's service. If, however, the slave had been permanently injured, the plaintiff could recover damages for the deteriorated value of the slave in lieu of damages for loss of service. Finally, if he had been killed, the plaintiff would have been entitled to damages equal to the actual value of the slave, who would not have been entitled to recover damages for loss of the slave's service. The case that was cited, this Johnson v. Perry case that was cited here, did not involve a car or any other normal kind of personal property. It involved David, who was an enslaved man in Tennessee. David's case arose out of a verbal dispute with a group of white men. Likely fearing severe injury, he freed himself once they captured him, jumped off a four-foot high ledge to evade his pursuers, and in the process severely and permanently injured his leg. All the court blamed David for his own injury, comparing him to a frightened animal. They ultimately awarded damages to his owner who brought their suit. This kind of callousness to David as a piece of property was a natural result of slave commerce. In such a context, the Johnson's court's decision to award David's owner damages for injury made legal sense, but it doesn't make sense today. The citation of slave cases, however, is more common than you might think. 
My research has uncovered hundreds of citations by modern judges to slave cases. That is cases in which enslaved people are the subjects or objects of litigation. All of the cases here in red, courts in every federal circuit, even the Supreme Court have cited slave cases in the last 35 years. In 80% of these cases, courts don't even acknowledge that they're citing cases that involve human property. My work shows that judges who treat slave cases like regular case, cases cause harms uh, cognizable in both legal and dignitary terms. First, slave cases often require the court to recognize that enslaved people differed from other types of property. These cases can therefore sometimes provide unclear precedent. For example, a case about slave hiring could be cited as precedent for cases about borrowing property or employment law, depending on if the modern court treats the enslaved person primarily as person or as property. Slave precedent may therefore provide less clear authority than a court's reading of a case suggests. In tire shredders, for example, the, the case I started off with, the court ended up distinguishing Johnson in the line of cases that followed. The Johnson court had held that an injured party could not recover damages for loss of use and the value of damaged property. The tire shredders court, however, allowed for recovery of both types of damages because the tire shredding machinery was commercial property that could not be easily replaced. In the 19th century, however, enslaved people like David were often considered to be commercial property that also could not be easily replaced. By misunderstanding the context, the court misunderstands the case. Second, by citing slavery, judges risk relying on motivated reasoning designed to protect slavery and racial subjugation. Some Southern judges saw their role as strengthening slave commerce and may have been focused more on this than on coming to well-reasoned decisions. Third, slave cases have been abrogated, that is overruled, at least in part by the 13th Amendment that bans slavery in the United States. To cite these cases, judges should note this abrogation and explain why they remain persuasive precedent, but I haven't found a single example of a judge doing this. Citing slavery also creates three serious dignitary harms. First, by treating slave cases as normal precedent, judges disregard the white supremacist language and reasoning underlying these cases. Second, judges hide the role lawyers played in facilitating the slave system by not discussing the context of the cited cases. Third, they perpetuate the dehumanization of the law of slavery. These cases only make sense as precedent if judges continue to treat their enslaved subjects as property. Such dehumanization is evident in the use of slave cases as support for basic propositions of law. Let me give you some examples. In 2015, Justice Thomas, writing in dissent, relied on a case about the inheritance of enslaved people for the proposition that, quote, the judiciary is the tribunal appointed by the Constitution and the law for the ascertainment of private rights and the redress of private wrongs. He thus justified judicial power by pointing to one of the worst abuses of judicial power, its enforcement of slavery. The Maryland Supreme Court similarly failed to recognize the irony of using an 1862 case involving the sale of enslaved people as a lone source for justifying the doctrine of collateral estoppel. Only from a myopic vantage point does a case about the sale of humans serve to justify a legal rule on, as the court puts it, what justice requires and the public tranquility demands. The problems created by the direct citation of slave cases are compounded by judges who, without citing slave cases directly, cite doctrine derived from slavery, maybe without even realizing it. One way to get a sense of this influence is to examine the networks of citation that slave cases help generate. I took a random sample of 200 general cases from before the 13th Amendment was ratified and 200 slave cases from the same period. This sample suggests that slave cases in blue are just as likely, if not more likely, to be cited um, as other cases from Southern courts during the same period. Judges, in other words, have not systematically avoided citing slave cases. This means that rules derived from slave cases might be influencing modern doctrine without us knowing. Let me give you an example of that influence. In 1848, Maryland's highest court decided Townsend v. Townsend. That case dealt with whether to enforce an enslaver's will. In that will, the slave owner had attempted to free the enslaved people he owned because he thought that otherwise God would punish him. His son argued that the will should not be enforced because that belief was irrational. The court agreed with the son. This is the first case to recognize what came to be known as the insane delusion rule, which allows courts to refuse to enforce provisions of wills that deems to reflect irrational beliefs. 
The insane delusion rule has since been widely adopted across the United States. The Townsend's court adoption of this rule appears to have been influenced by the case's slave context. In the 1840s, many slaveholders and politicians understood manumission as a threat to slaveholding. From this perspective, the prospect of manumission threatened racial hierarchy, and slavers were particularly afraid of the insurrectionary threat of free Black people. It seems likely that the court's dislike for manumission encouraged it to view Townsend's wishes with suspicion and to look for a way to avoid fulfilling Townsend's bequests. In its modern form, commentators have not recognized the roots of this rule in slavery, but they have criticized the insane delusion rule for encouraging challengers to a will to exploit a decedent's unpopular beliefs and for leading fact finders to import their own biases into decision making. Understanding the basis of this rule and white supremacy helps to help to explain why it continues to lead to questionable outcomes. This is just one line of precedent. We can get a better picture of how influential slave cases have been by studying the citation networks they have created. Take this example, created using Gephi network visualization software. The darker the dot, the more recent the case. Although this case has not been cited by a recent case directly, there are several um, recent cases that cite cases that cite it. Just this one case has a much larger influence on the law than the direct citation to the cases the case suggests. Now, this is what happens when you do this network analysis for the 200 slave cases in my sample. Here you can see the 200 slave cases on the top, a much larger set of cases that directly cite them in the second layer, and then on the bottom, an enormous number of cases that are within two steps of those cases. As you can also see, the dots get darker in the third generation, meaning that they are closer to the present. If we extrapolate out from this sample, we get some surprising results. According to my calculations, 13% of all American cases either cite a slave case directly or cite a case that cites a slave case. Much more research is needed to understand the deep influence of these cases in the over 800,000 cases that are just two steps away from slave cases. The Citing Slavery Project is undertaking that work right now. When our project launched in January 2020, our database included approximately 300 slave cases that have been cited by American courts and published opinions in the last 35 years. Thanks to the funding provided by the Michigan State University's College of Law and the work of our team of editors, last summer we were able to expand the site to include more than 2,000 cases from Georgia and Tennessee. We plan to upload another large batch of cases from Alabama, Arkansas, and the District of Columbia, Mississippi, and Texas soon. We are working on Louisiana, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Our goal is to eventually catalog every United States case involving an enslaved person and to give lawyers, educators, and the general public the ability to examine the influence these cases have had on American law. The process of building our database is labor intensive, but relatively straightforward. We have been using the commercial legal databases Westlaw and LexisNexis to find cases that mention slavery from before 1875. Then we read the cases looking for those in which an enslaved person was involved. For these cases, we collect identifying information about the case, including the number of times it has been cited. We also record the names of enslaved and freed people when available and include them with our data about the case in a spreadsheet. In addition, we write a one sentence summary of the main subject of the case to give the case some context. The final step is linking the case to the Case Law Access Project, also known as CAP, a recent project of Harvard Law Library, which has used scans of reports, reporters and optical character recognition software to provide free access to full text copies of more than 6 million American judicial opinions on their website, uh, case.law, to find cases on CAP, we use the search feature on CAP's site and then add each case's unique CAP ID to our spreadsheet. After review, we batch upload our cases to the site. Our goal is to eventually catalog every United States case involving an enslaved person and to give lawyers, educators, and the general public the ability to examine the influences these cases have had on American law. Once a case is added to the site, the Citing Slavery Project provides the information we have collected, including the case, when the case was decided, the location of the decision, information about the case reporter, 
our one sentence summary of the case, and if available, the names of the enslaved or freed people involved in the case to users. Here's an example of the information our database provides about the Johnson v. Perry case we discussed earlier. Citingslavery.org provides information about the case, where to find it, and a short summary. From this page, users of the database can click to, to view a full text copy of the case on CAP. Users can either view a digitized version of the case or access a PDF of the original reporter. Using the Case Law Access Projects database allows us to provide our users information about the cases that cite the cases in our database. Thus, they can see that Johnson v. Perry has been cited 10 times, including as recently as 1999 by a tire shredders court. Once we have completed the database, the database, our users will therefore not only be able to study the history of the law of slavery, but also uncover its connections to the present. We hope that many different audiences will find the Citing Slavery Project useful and relevant. We are especially excited to provide a resource to those who don't, do not have access to traditional legal databases like Westlaw and LexisNexis, which are prohibitive, prohibitively expensive and often not available to those outside of law schools. We hope to encourage high school teachers and professors to use the Citing Slavery Project to allow their students to engage with the history of slavery. We are currently working on a pilot program that would develop lesson plans for use in a Detroit high school. This year, the Blue Book, the citation manual used by lawyers and legal scholars, added Rule 10.7.1D, which requires lawyers citing slave cases to acknowledge when an enslaved person was a subject or object of a dispute. This rule has received attention from law librarians, scholars, and a reporter for the Washington Post. It has even faced some pushback from Will Bodd and Stephen Sachs, prominent scholars at the University of Chicago and Harvard, respectively, who have described it as legally misleading, morally misguided, and unscholarly. As this reaction suggests, we have a lot more work to do. We'll talk about some of that work now. Um, the project has uh, recently been working on additional features to encourage engagement and to make the database more accessible for non-lawyers. Spotlights provide short summaries of significant or interesting cases editors have come across during research. These features draw attention to individual cases and introduce users to the type of cases they might find on the site. Another upcoming feature for the project is a blog page that will allow contributors to provide additional context to our cases, highlight the impact of the cases in modern decisions, and offer a forum for discussion on the significance of the cases. In addition to adding content to the site, we're also working to integrate the Citing Slavery Project with existing resources to encourage the use of our data. We plan to integrate our data set with um, enslaved.org, another MSU-based project, which provides coordinated access to a variety of data sets to provide information about the lives of individual enslaved people. We've also talked to a representative of Hein Online, a more widely accessible legal database, about the possibility of using Hein Online's extensive uh, database of law journals and treatises to allow our users to see not only when cases have been cited by judges, but also by scholars. One of the most exciting aspects of the project for me has been the ability to work with the students who have done much of the work of collecting the slave cases in our database. I'll turn it over to them now to discuss some of what they've seen. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> sorry, the, the Citing Slavery Project for me was easy to uh, contribute to and sign on to because of how simple the premise is. The sheer experiment of chronicling and synthesizing these cases is important in and of itself. It begins to put names and experiences to the sheer numbers of the enterprise of slavery in the United States as well as its legacy. Even if the majority of the cases up up uphold, uphold rulings that may in enforce valid property law, it is still important to note and teach that this law has vast underpinnings that originate the in the purchase, sale, and forced alienation of labor of other human beings. Another key facet is to understand that the core hypocrisy is the core hypocrisy behind some of these opinions. 
For example, Richard versus Van Meter is an 1827 case from Washington, D.C. that denounced the ability for the enslaved and the masters to contract fundamentally in order to prevent remitting a, pl a, pl a plaintiff's freedom. The irony, of course, being that plenty of people were enabled, enabled to voluntarily contract into slavery um, throughout the existence of its institution. The context that this project has affords to our greater legal system and consequently our government is imperative to understanding the changes that need to be made to rectify the injustices that our legal system and our government have presided over. The Citing Slavery Project has helped us also to realize the pervasive influence of slave cases, even in the cases that we read for our class. In my Trust in a States class, we read In Re Will of Moses, a 1969 case that demonstrated the doctrine of undue influence, which allows wills to be overturned. The textbook mentions that In Re Will of Moses is determined completely based on one case, this case being Croft v. Adler. Croft itself mentions that its determination is based completely on Meek v. Perry, a slave case. In Croft v. Adler, there was an extensive review of the authorities relating to the question under consideration. The court said that Meek v. Perry is perhaps the leading case. It involved a will by a ward, leaving a substantial amount of her property to her guardian. The court held that this presumption of invalidity applies to wills as well as deeds. What the court did not mention is that we, Meek v. Perry and the substantial property at issue were enslaved people, including two young boys, Wallace and Monroe. Slavery was not discussed when we discussed this case in class, but it, uh, its presence illustrates how closely slave cases are linked to modern law taught in law schools. Um, one aspect of the project that has had the most impact on me has been the patterns of dehumanization that we see throughout the cases. As I have worked through the Mississippi cases, I discovered a pattern of dehumanization specifically as it related to enslaved women. Over and over again, I encountered cases where a white man was being sued after sexually assaulting an enslaved woman, but was not being sued for the actual rape. Instead, he was being sued for the damage to another person's property. These cases are a part of a larger pattern of abuses faced by enslaved women whom the law considered unable to actually be raped. It's incredibly eye-opening to not only how the law upheld the system of slavery, but also the ways in which it upheld the racist foundations upon which the system was built and justified. And I have also seen the ways in which the important research we are doing can be applied to racism across all areas of law. Understanding how slavery was upheld through property, contract, criminal law, and more helps us to see the ways that racism and racist systems have been upheld in other ways. I came to law school because of a desire to pursue a career in immigration law, and as I've taken what I've learned from this project into my studies, it's become easier to see how much of immigration law is founded in stereotypes and white supremacist ideals about non-white immigrants to this country. And as we've seen over, those last, over these last several years, those ideals about immigration haven't gone away with the passage of time. And it has become increasingly clear that we can't begin to make changes to our immigration system without first acknowledging why it exists within the framework it does. Another example that many law students may already be familiar with is a case we learn about in our first year of law school, Johnson v. McIntosh. This case, a foundational Supreme Court case that forms a foundation of our understanding of ownership and the right to dispose of property, was decided based on the idea that indigenous communities in North America were not civilized enough to own property and therefore did not have the right to sell, gift, or dispose of their lands as they saw fit. When we study this case, we are reinforcing those ideas, often without even acknowledging the serious implications of the language used in that case and the way that this decision is weaponized against Indigenous communities. And these comments demonstrate the continued citation of slave cases is part of a broader failure to grapple with the legacy of slavery. Like the response to any atrocity, legal recognition of slave citation will always be incomplete. Lawyers, nevertheless, should take this opportunity to reconsider the myopic perspective that has led them to continue to cite slave cases more than 100 years after the ratification of the 13th Amendment. Thanks again for joining us to discuss our project. We look forward to hearing your questions, comments, and advice. And please stay in touch by visiting our website or by following us on Twitter. Thanks. <laughs>